Looking for a guaranteed way to create content that resonates with your audience? Start a podcast, interview your ideal clients, and let them choose the topic of the interview. Because if your ideal clients care about the topic, there's a good chance the rest of your audience will care about it too. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivy with Sweetfish Media. Guys, I've got with me today, Kylan Lundeen, who is head of marketing at Qualtrics. Kylan, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. Excited to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's going to be fun, guys. So we're going to be talking about how to win at the experience economy. And we've got some some insights that I'm excited for Kylan to get over to you guys. But before we get into all of that, Kylan, I would love it if you would just give us a little bit of background on you know, yourself and what you and the folks at Qualtrics have been up to these days. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I've been at Qualtrics for seven years. I've been running marketing for the last five. Before that, I was in private equity for five years. The pretty significant business sort of focus shift uh, coming over to Qualtrics and joining the tech company. I was at Stanford, um, fell in love with marketing while I was in business school and made a connection with the professor who knew the CEO of Qualtrics. And before I kind of knew it was happening, I was here. You know, it's actually kind of interesting that the five years that I've been working on marketing, I've learned a lot of new lessons because we don't have sort of that like deep, deep marketing leader, um, you know, history where it's like, Mm -hmm. I didn't come from a marketing background. We're trying new things. We're trying to do it differently. And in a lot of ways, I think that's led to our success. Unfortunately, we've learned a a few painful lessons along the way, but I think we've always liked looking at it with a a fresh set of eyes. For sure. It sounds like, you know, every, every industry and certainly every vertical within um, B2B, you know, there are sort of these common practices that everybody is doing. Um, But if you don't have the sort of traditional marketing background, as you mentioned, I imagine then you're, you're sort of not at risk as, as uh, other folks would be to doing things, you know, that are sort of the same. So it might occur to you more easily to do things that break through the noise. So that's interesting. I like that you shared that with us. And so with respect to winning at the experience economy, talk a little bit about uh, what you mean when you say the experience economy uh, and what the state of that is right now. Yeah, great. Well, I'll start with the experience economy, right? So, you know, it's interesting because people keep saying like, you know, wow, Qualtrics, the growth is explosive. We're growing like crazy. Right? The media law, the acquisition with SAP, like what, what's changed? Feedback has been around for a long time, right? So like what, what's new here? And the reality is feedback has been around for a long time. But what's different is people, the expectations of consumers have just fundamentally shifted. And what companies are able to do with the feedback is shifted through Technology innovation. So, for example, you know, when you were young, if you ate a bad hamburger at, you know, let's say McDonald's or something, you probably wouldn't even bring it up to the company. I mean, maybe you'd stop by the next time and tell me, I mean, maybe they give you a vow. I don't know. But like, that just wasn't part of like how we inter- interacted with companies. Well, now, if you have bad experience with a company you know, with, with McDonald's or any sort of burger joint, you would expect to be addressed if you had an issue. Like, if you tweeted at Wendy's, they're going to respond, right? Like that's just part of like how we've been trained through this sort of like hyper-connected world that we live in. And so, you know, people have expectations of being sort of treated differently. But then not only that, before, if you were an airline, let's say, an airline might have 100,000 weekly travelers or something. And it wasn't really pragmatic to ask all your travelers, how, how was your experience? Because 
guess what? You know, airlines, you know, often the flights are delayed. There's inclement weather. There's things out of the control. So if people give you feedback like, hey, the experience wasn't great, unless you have a 10,000 person call center to follow up with all those people, you actually provide an even worse experience by asking them how it went. And then they give you, bad, you know, negative feedback and then you can't do anything about it. Right. And, you know, the only thing worse than not asking someone how the experience went is asking them and then not following up. Right. And so companies, for the most part, for years, what they do is they'd say, hey, look, let's ask a small percentage of our travelers how we did. And, you know, we don't need to get back to them. We'll just sort of like say, wow, here's some generally speaking, you know, 10 percent of our travelers didn't like this part and 5 percent did like this part. So let's do less of the bad stuff and more of the good stuff. And overall, our, our airline should get better. Right. Like we'd be a better experienced company. Well, what's happened is now almost every business that is, you know, delivering meaningful results, they have the granular level of data where they know the lifetime value of every one of their customers. They know if you travel for business, how often, if you're, you know, you get uh, first class tickets because your business pays for it. If that's true, then you might have a, you know, a $30,000 lifetime value with them and they're willing to have a heroic intervention moment with you make sure that you're a lifetime customer. But they also know that maybe you switch airlines every month. You're always looking for the cheapest deal. In fact, you might not even be a profitable customer for them. Now, they know that about you, but what they don't know often is how your experience went. And so what's changed is all of a sudden companies for the first time have the ability to understand how you felt about the experience through a variety of touch points. So it's no longer just like, well, we have to just email everybody and ask them how it went. Well, now you, you might be volunteering social data on a Yelp site. You might be providing feedback in a forum on, a, a, you know, through your smartwatch, through your phone, through an app, through the airline app that you're using. There's a lot of ways now that people are rating their experience. Every time you get out of an Uber, you're rating your experience. Things like that exist across a variety of channels. Mm -hmm. So now the airline can say, I actually can understand your experience at least once through 20 different touch points, right? Like one of those touch points, we can access you because it's a channel you like to use. You, com you know, comment on social media all the time. That's a great channel for us to get feedback on. Great. So now the question is, great. So we have inputs and technology that enables us to connect with you, have a personalized conversation. But what about getting 10,000 comments a day from travelers that come in open verbatim text you know, messages? Like that's really hard to make sense of. So unless you have a, a whole call, university-sized call center to try to diagnose <laughs> right. that stuff and follow up, that's problematic. Well, now systems like Qualtrics that provide artificial intelligence, machine learning to pull together mountains, sift through mountains of data, mountains of unstructured text, and then sift through it and understand the core sentiments, key topics, et cetera, boil those up, and then automatically make recommendations and automatically route them to people in your company who are in the best position to affect change. So for example, if you're an airline company, you might see an emerging topic about delayed flights. Well, maybe there's inclement weather in a certain city, so that you're probably not gonna go and take action on anybody that complained about a delayed flight. Maybe you will, depending on the situation, but maybe not. But if the, award, if the word abuse comes up, you absolutely, unquestionably, are gonna follow up with that passenger and take care of it right away. And by the way, if it comes up about the gate agent, or if it comes up about the meal, you probably would route those to different people because there's right. different folks that are in charge of resolving those. Yeah. So now what happens is there's technology like Qualtrics that says, I can engage, help you as a business engage with all of your customers at whatever touch point and channel they prefer at the time that's most relevant. And then by the way, when we collect all that, we can automate the action of sifting through it, making sense of it. Then we can even automatically route it in the channel that's relevant to the agents on your side that can go deliver results. So let me just give you a really tactical example. In Qualtrics, we ask for feedback constantly on our website. But again, we get a lot of you know, monthly visits to the site. And so it's not possible for someone to read through all the different comments. So what ends up happening is this Qualtrics technology is reading all the comments. And for example, if it says, you know, maybe what, what feedback comes in and says, couldn't log in. Okay, so if someone couldn't log into the website, does that feedback go to our web team? Does it go to a product marketing manager? Like, who does that go to? Well, in this case, it goes to the web dev team who's in charge of logging into the product through the website. And by the way, they don't use email. So it's going to go through a Slack channel right directly to them to go fix it. 
And that all happens automatically. I don't have to be, you know, intervene as the marketing leader. But on the same token, if someone gives feedback that says, couldn't find pricing, and then, you know, they, they, they weren't able to make their purchase couldn't find pricing, well, that should probably go to the person that owns that marketing page. Um, and by the way, they use Asana in this case at Qualtrics. And so it routes it through that channel. So in a variety of ways, like that's what's changed is all of a sudden the technology enables you to have conversations with your customers, employees, your stakeholders at scale. And by the way, consumers expect that now. So in a lot of ways, we're just kind of bringing those two, the expectation and technology together to provide a way to manage and improve what we call the four core experiences of business, customer experience, employee experience, your product experience, and the brand experience they have overall. So I'll pause there and see if that makes sense. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. And you gave us you gave us so much. The one thing that's really interesting, though, is the examples you gave were B two C organizations, right? Like if you were, you know, directly dealing with the consumer on as far as that feedback goes. How far along are B two B organizations in understanding how to or, or why they should be doing the same thing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So B2B is actually a really big part of our customer base. And what, it, you know, so manufacturing, um, a lot of supply chain sort of uh, touch points. And what happens is businesses basically say, you know, hey, in fact, think about a company like Caterpillar, right? Caterpillar sells to big, big, you know, mining companies, et cetera. But in that case, it becomes even more essential for them to provide a good experience to their very often limited customer base, right? So they might say, I have, a hundred accounts that provide a billion dollars in revenue, right? Could, there's there are situations where that's true. Boeing, you know, again, Caterpillar, some of these businesses. And basically they've said, not only do I need to make sure I have a good relationship with them, because by the way, they often have a very high touch sales model, right? Where the sales reps very involved, et cetera. But there's so many touch points that don't go through the sales channel that they need to know, right? So the service model, right? So a, a delivery was made on a tractor or an airplane or something, and the expectations were met on the delivery time or on a certain component. Maybe there was a, um, a, maybe one of the tires wasn't quite installed the right way or whatever that is. Providing a often almost a seemingly unlimited way for the end user to give feedback to the supplier, to the vendor across a variety of touch points, but also just sort of different problem areas becomes increasingly important, right? So instead of relying on a single individual who owns the relationship, and by the way, that salesperson might leave at some point, right? Maybe a different sure. option. And that relationship's gone. Well, now the companies have said, no, 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 no. We want to have a direct relationship. We don't want to be disintermediated by like a, a salesperson or someone else that could, be, you know, could leave. We want to own that relationship. We want to get good at it. We want to build the muscle of having conversations with our end customers, even if it's a business. So um, that happens a lot. Now, at the same time, another sort of really practical use case is, um, I guess this technically is B2C, but it's really B2B in the sense that the IT owners inside of big companies they provide technology tools to their constituents, which are often employees. How do we enable employees to do their jobs at scale through the technology of the company? Well, what we're finding is a lot of IT companies are, are trying to apply experience management to make sure that, like, how are we doing? Are we enabling our employees with the tools they need to be able to provide our customers the results that they're looking for? So in a sense, it's, it's still B2B. And that's a really big market for us right now. Yeah, because at the end of the day, right, these, these labels we put on this stuff, more and more folks are understanding whether it's, you know, B2B borrowing things that B2C has gotten for a long time, gotten right. The reason why those things do translate and do work a lot of the time, especially the way that you're talking about it, is because at the end of the day, we're just talking about connecting people. We're just talking about delivering experiences to people. And whether you are selling to a business or directly to a consumer, the more you're approach or process understands and then demonstrates that understanding that we're just dealing with people, the better off you're going to be. So I, I like this for B2B for that reason. Um, so tell us how to get those breakthrough results, how to, whether you're B2B or B2C, how to make this really work and, and, and see some, some impact. Yeah, I'll give you just a couple examples. Um, you know, one, I think a, a recent one that's ongoing right now. So American Express is a big client. As you can imagine, they compete on experience. It's, it's foundational. It's in their DNA, right? They 
when, a lot of times when you think Amex, you think experience, right? Like I'm going to have a good experience, whether I'm calling to check on an overdue bill pay or whatever. I was like, it's going to be a good experience. They care about it so deeply. They're constantly innovating. So, you know, one of the cool things they're piloting right now that's delivering breakthrough results. This is, I think this is fantastic. And it's just one example of, you know, 10,000 brands that are on the platform are all doing a variety of very cool things. But here's one. So most call centers, right? You know, Amex runs a very large call center, right? Because they have so many customers um, who need sort of high frequency touch points on, you know, money. It's important. It's, it's, it's their financial well-being. So they're, they're checking in often. Now, unfortunately, when you run massive call centers, you can't maybe run the Zappos model of like, you know, stay on the phone for two hours and order pizza if you need to. Um, that doesn't work at volume at the same scale that, that Amex does. So in a lot of times in a call center like that, the KPIs on performance would be how many tickets can you answer in one day and how quickly can you resolve the issue, right? So how many people can you talk to and how quickly can you get them off the phone, basically? Because you right. need the wrong volume. But you know, do it with a smile, have a good experience, et cetera. Well, not for American Express. They would never live with just that. They want to do more. And so, yes, when it, somebody calls in, let's say you called in to you know, look for an overdue balance or just check on your balance. Yes, this, the, call, the agent that takes your call is going to get all the operational data in front of them, right? It's going to say your name, how long you've been a member, your outstanding balance, how many cards you have with them, et cetera. They're going to know all that just like any other call center would. But not only that, at the same time, their screen is going to pipe in experience data from the last interaction they had with you. Mm -hmm. So let's say the last time you called in and they know your LTV, they know how valuable of a client you are. Are you a platinum customer? Are you a black card customer? They know. Not only are they going to have the O data, they're going to have your last experience. And so let's say the last time you called in, it didn't go very well. And you gave feedback that, you know what? It, it wasn't a great experience. Well, now that they know that, they can take action. They can intervene. They can rescue. So they're going to get their KPIs and they're going to get this X data that says the last time we talked to you didn't go well. And they're gonna, it's going to dynamically shift their KPIs in real time. And all of a sudden, the employee, instead of being measured by number of tickets and how fast they could resolve them, it switches dynamically in real time to the satisfaction of the resolution. So think about that for a second. Now their job shifts. They kick their feedback a little bit. And they're like, look, my only job today is to make sure you are 100% satisfied, not that I kind of get you off the phone and that you're okay with the solution. So it's done a couple things for them. One you can imagine that's a great experience for you. I'm going to invest whatever time, whatever resources I need to make sure you're happy. That has led to you know, loyalty, repeat purchase, you know, word of mouth, share of wallet, et cetera. But you know, one of the positive externalities has been, think about the employees. When you work in a call center, that's a hard job where you're grinding out call after call. All of a sudden, once a day or more, you have the opportunity to now be the hero. You have the chance to sort of step up and say, I get to go and, and, and deliver some exciting you know, opportunity to you where you leave with having a better day. Well, what's, what that's done is it's improved the employee engagement across the employee base as well. And so now you have a happier employees answering phones with people that are you know, having issues. And it's just like a beautiful synergy where all of a sudden they're able to kind of deliver breakthrough business results. And you know, they're a customer, so I won't share exactly those results, but sure. you know, through Amex Forum, they're amazing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, no, that, that I'm, my, my little wheels are spinning here in, in terms of how, how that's applicable on say a B2B account management team or a B2B customer success team, right? That same sort of thing, right? Understanding what this particular um, account's experience has been over time. I think it probably would be at the account level versus at the individual level, like you're talking about in a B2B sense, but still makes sense, right? What this account's experience and feedback has been overall right there. And then, like you said, being able to real time make that pivot. Because a lot of the time that that is what's uh, killing the experience for the employee is that pressure to hurry up and take care of this thing and, and not feeling like they can be authentic in the moment because of that that metric. So taking that out of the equation, God, that's, that's a, that's a breakthrough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of times people sort of equate experience with just like the service side, like a call center, which is, you know, where I started. But the reality is like, think about on the product front. So Belkin International, Belkin's an amazing company, um, you know, networking, routing, et cetera, personal mm -hmm. connection uh, products. And, um, you know, they, they launched a product. This is very common in sort of between like CPG companies, product companies. They launched a product and the way it was positioned was not resonating with the audience. They were launching it for like prosumers, right? So like higher end, people that are interested in the, the, 
the details of their home router, et cetera. So they launched this product. It's very powerful, but um, it, it wasn't landing in the market. In fact, you know, typically products know in the first 30 days whether they're going to hit or not. Mm-hmm. And so you have this 30-day window, which is like, it's, it's like the kiss of death if you don't make your targets in those first 30 days. And they, by the end of the first 30 days, they were projecting $80 million sales gap from what they forecasted and needed to do with the product of what they were actually going to deliver. And so they used Qualtrics in real time to reach out to these early customers, right? So they were going through Amazon. They were reaching out to all the early customers and finding out what they liked, what they didn't like. And they were making live changes daily in the positioning. So again, the product was amazing. They built a great product, but it wasn't landing with the right customer audience in the right time. So they made daily changes, they had daily huddles where they were getting feedback coming in live from current users, making adjustments to what they liked and didn't like, repositioning the product in the marketplace from the keywords they used to how they, what the promises they made about the technology and the performance. And by the end of you know, the six-month window of the trial, they'd closed the $80 million sales gap. And so when it comes to product experience, you know, it's just as pivotal and important as something like, you know, the service experience in a call center. Mm-hmm. Man, that's, that's lights out. I'm glad that you made, laid that out because yeah, they're, depending on what, whoever's listening right now and, and, and me, depending on what your background is, that's going to be like the easiest place to see where this is uh, applicable. But yeah, it's, it has all these, you know, multiple ways that it can, you know, just really up your game for lack of a better term. Uh, and as far as, closing the the feedback loop and understanding how to use that information in an intelligent way. So thank you for laying that out for us. And now that I have successfully picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, it is time for you to tell us what you're putting in it. So let us know, Kylan, what is a, tell us about a a learning resource that you've engaged with here recently that's, you know, informing your approach that's just got you excited these days. Yeah. You know, um, maybe I'll share out something that's sort of like a real time sort of decision-making path that we're on at Qualtrics. Um, and the learnings that are coming out of it. So I'll try to keep this to just a two-minute share out. You know, one of the things, we have a really unique DNA at Qualtrics between sales and marketing. That classic, like, tension just doesn't exist here. Of Like, you know, marketing says sales never falls up on the leads we give them, and sales says you never get us any good leads. That really doesn't exist. And we've, we've done a couple things to go solve that. So I'll share them out here. And if they're relevant to the audience, you'll sort of know what's filling my head right now. So one is we created an attribution model. The attribution typically really is painful and can often cause you know, tension in that relationship. So what we did is we said, hey, we're actually going to go and drive all the way to the point where it's completely like almost, it's it's like indisputable, whether it was a marketing source, you know, opportunity or a sales source opportunity. So what we did is we said, we're only going to count marketing source opportunities from when, if the name comes in for the very first time in any database ever in the company through a marketing form. Right. So like it wasn't even a twinkle in the eye of some sales rep ever. Like something like that, a business card hiding somewhere. Like never. Okay. Requirement number one. Requirement number two is within 30 days of getting that form filled out, of someone giving us their business contact information, it needs to go, it needs to be qualified by marketing, sent over to an inbound sales development rep who qualifies it. They run through like the medic step and program is their decision authority and timing and budget. And then if they deem that appropriate, it goes over to an account executive who owns a quota. They get on the phone with the person and vet and say, yes, it actually is a real opportunity. And then they add it to their pipeline, which means their sales leader is going to be all over them about it. So it's a serious commitment. That has to happen within 30 days. If it takes 31 days, it's a sales source opportunity. If it takes 60 days, sales source. It has to come through marketing channel in 30 days, go to an opportunity with the sales rep. And what that's done is it's made it so financing. I just made a $3 million um, incremental request yesterday and it was a no-brainer. They're happy to do it because there's, it, they know where the incremental revenue comes from. There's no debate whether like, well, was it just influenced and maybe marketing was going to close that one revenue or sales was going to close it anyway. Mm-hmm. There's delineation now that even though it under um, represents what marketing does, it drives extreme accountability and we're able to go and ask for the resources that we need. And there's no sort of debate about whether it's really going to deliver the impact. So that's one is nail attribution, get it right. Don't, I would say don't follow the traditional models. There's time decay and there's first touch, last touch, modified first touch. They get so complicated, it just sort of erodes trust and I think actually undermines what you're trying to deliver. So nail attribution, make it clear. The second one is we ended up putting something together called getting to two. And what that means is it's often where, you know, if you ask an engineer or um, a product person or anybody else in the company, what does marketing do? They'll often answer like, I don't know, are they in charge of billboards or something? Like, are they go to trade shows, I think? 
And I just, I, I couldn't tolerate that, right? Like the old private equity side of me wanted to just live in the data. And so I thought, how can we come up with a shared metric that makes sense to our team and sales and everybody else? So what we did is we did some backwards math and we said, okay, to never miss our sales goal ever, to make sure every sales rep hit their quota for the rest of their time at Qualtrics. That would be amazing, right? If to do that, right, right, right. they all need four opportunities every single week, new opportunities. If we can do that, they would all be successful. We'd never miss our overall number and they would all be successful salespeople. And that's really important to us. So we worked back and just said, okay, well, our client success team is able to drum up one. Salespeople, we think they on their own can drum up one. And marketing, can you bring us two? That, those four would make this you know, team insanely successful. So we said, okay, you know what? We're not there today. In fact, when we looked at it, it, we were delivering one half of an opportunity per sales rep per week. We need to get to two. So we said, I want to get to two, rep, two opportunities per sales rep per week. And if we can do that, sales will be wildly successful. Now, here's what came out of that. One, when they're out hiring and recruiting salespeople, their promise is, hey, look, here's how this works. You need to find an opportunity. Client success will bring you one and marketing will bring you two. That's a really valuable proposition for sales reps. And they say, I, I could go be successful in that environment. Let me go for it. The next thing is now it's amazing. It's very clear. Every salesperson knows what our job is and marketers know what their job is. When we go to a trade show, it's not about making sure the booth looks great or that the NPS is high on the back end or the swag we gave out was great. We know that our job is to deliver two opportunities per rep per week. That alignment has been pretty game-changing for us as a company and definitely as a marketing organization. So those are two tidbits I'd share and maybe encourage others to look for their, you know, something similar. I love it. I'm going to use it. And thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm sure that everybody listening, just like me, since you came in just dropping jewels on us, uh, everybody's become fast fans of yours. Let us know how those folks can connect with you. How can we uh, keep up with you? Yeah, great. So um, find me on LinkedIn. It's pretty easy. Kylan Lundin, K-Y-L-A-N, Lundin, L-U-N-D-E-E-N. It's a pretty rare name. So you, you're likely to find me. Um, and then the other way is you can just email me at Qualtrics. So Kylan L at Qualtrics.com, direct shop. Perfect. This has been so great, so helpful. Lots of insights that I can't wait for people to, to listen to and be able to put into action uh, at their own orgs. Thank you again, Kylan. My pleasure. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.